Boy, I heard that good. <laughs> I had the thing on my head when I moved the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> That's what I told you. You got to be... Uh, like when you bang on the thing, now you... Yes, we got this. <laughs> damn it, damn it, damn it. Can you turn me down just a little bit? Sure. How is that? Let me know when it's good. Is that's that, good. Is up that, a little bit. Up a little bit. Up a little there. bit. All right, that's good right there. You like that? I like it. Okay. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> All right, let me print this out. All right. You yes. ready? Ready to go. Okay. And now for something special. The unit is self-contained with its own Sadler, Farrier, Wheelwright, and so on. It's a rigorous training dished on who know all there is to know about horses, and it brings results. We take you behind the scenes now to show just some of the interesting aspects of this training. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein, the best podcast to create sound of horses from the ground up. Mike Stein is a registered journeyman farrier with an APF1 accreditation. On this week's episode, position of the horse's pelvic and how it affects movement. And watch this video. Would you pick up this horse's feet? And also, why you never look a gifted horse in the mouth or the hooves. All this and much, much more will be discussed here on Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. And over to my far right side. Far right hand side is Mike Sign. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you, Travis? You now don't lie to me. You're not doing good. I'm doing something. <laughs> you you told me on the way up here to the studio that you were arm wrestling a horse. And the horse won. Yeah. So tell me you're all stiff and, and tired and and you're a little sluggish this morning. So tell me what you were doing arm wrestling this horse. Oh, she's a very quiet. She's played statue extremely well. <laughs> and she's a big girl. And uh, I tell everybody I do not do draft horse. I've got one draft horse I shoe, and she is a polite to, as polite to work around as any horse you could ever ever work on. Now, why don't you do draft horses? Because they're big and they're heavy, and it takes a lot to do them. Okay, so you're saying a gentleman by the age you know 30s and 40s could do this horse. You, on on the other hand, let the young guys mess with these horses. Let the young guys mess with these horses. You know, she's always polite. She's no problem putting a cradle under her all the way around. But yesterday, she wanted to play statue and not pick up a foot. Not that she would fight, but she wasn't going to budge to help. And just getting those big old legs up and those big old feet up and get the cradle under her. When she was in the cradle, she didn't move, but it's like, oh, geez. It's trying to, you know. Now, you, you physically have a cradle that goes underneath her belly and stuff? Well, there's there is a piece on a hoof stand that you slide up under the hoof and prop the hoof up okay so i'm not holding the weight of her leg okay i've seen that and like when you got a high when you got a high leg and she's standing her on the on her own you you're pretty much still dealing with oh basically the weight of you and that's make that's as long as she's standing on her other feet so you know you don't want those big ones leaning on you because you're not going to be a problem up so how tall was this horse that you were messing with and what was the horse's name her name is Fanny. She's not that big for a Percheron. She's she's less than seventeen hands. Okay, like sixteen two ish. And now you say she, you don't work on them because they're big horses. Now Dominique, our mare out there, she's sixteen two or sixteen one or somewhere around there, twenty two, twenty three. You know, I don't know what she is. Oh, she's not. She's not near as big as this. Oh, okay. And uh, now when you say big, like wide, like heavy. Wide like heavy, big, big chunky horses. Okay. Your plow horses. Okay. So like an absolute work horse, field horse. An absolute field horse, yeah. I don't, and, and there's not any real field horses much anymore. Most people that are doing that in this part of the country are doing it because it's entertaining. And she's actually, if, if anything, she's a trail riding horse at this point. She used to pull wedding carriages. Oh, nice. That's a pretty horse to be pulling a, a wedding carriage. Yeah. And so you're all stiff and sore today. Are you taking it easy after the show, or what do you got going on? I take it easy every day, Travis. <laughs> yes. I thought you knew. So talking about taking it easy, now here we are in uh, rounding out fall, getting ready to go into the winter in the next month or so. So all my grass has gotten dormant. Now, I was telling you that I bush hogged the front field, seeded it with uh, tall fescue, and so that field's ready to go. We had a nice good rainstorm that's all coming in, or all washed in the ground, ready for next season. The middle pasture is nothing but oak trees and pine needles, so there's no real 
vegetation other than weeds and and sometimes one of the horses will just eat the seed pods off the top of it right and then the back pasture where the mare is is we have to totally redo that field because that is going to be where she's going to be brooded brood mare is what she's going to end Mm -hmm. up being so we have to fix the fescue and and put something else out there now with that being said the grass isn't growing so my wife is putting you know bales or or flecks of hay the timothy orchard which is fifteen dollars for a compressed bale putting it in the into the bins all i now i know the horses need to eat all right to a certain point i understand that they need to eat but when i see these flex going into the bales all i see is dollar signs because my wife like everyone else likes to see their horses not fat and happy just happy you know oh here's a little bit more kibble here's a little bit more kibble as she's throwing these bales of hay or the flex of hay into their feed bins or the hay bins there's already hay in there already and i'm like well, why aren't they eating that? And you're adding more to it. And the only thing I can explain in my mind, I said, you know, he's just eating the marshmallows out of the cereal, you know, and leaving the cereal there. He's eating all the good parts and just leaving the bad parts. That's what you do, isn't it? I don't do that. No, I eat it because I eat the whole entire cereal because I paid for the damn cereal. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you're paying for the hay. I know. But the problem is there's hay already in the bin and it just drives me insane that my wife will go, well, she'll put a couple more this is fresh this is today's hay and then yesterday's hay is underneath that and the day before's hay is underneath that now granted yes every four or five days she'll go out there and and dump all that hay out in the pasture somewhere and hopefully that'll seed but you know do you keep adding hay no matter what oh this is today's feed this is today's feed this slop Uh, i know there's a movie out there where the dog i think it was um back to the future where the the thing, Doc had an automatic dog feeder, and it just kept dumping the food, the dog food, on top of the dog food, on top of the dog food. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know a good answer to that. I know that depending on the quality of the hay, there may be some stuff in there they don't like as much. Yeah. And how much are they being fed? And is this a reasonable amount for the horses? Or are they be, they're putting more hay in front of them than they actually need. Yeah, and that's that's what I think is happening. But don't tell my wife that, and you know, hopefully she'll listen to the show like three weeks later and go, well, what did you mean by that? Right. <laughs> so, all right, guys, we got a big show to get into, so stick around. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. You want a Mountain Dew or something? No, 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 I'm good. Are you We're a, good. Are you a We're soda? Good. Are you a soda drinker at all or no? No, not anymore. No. Yeah. I know I kind of gave that up, too. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Mike Stein. He was the official farrier in the 2018 World Equestrian Games. And make sure if you have a question for Mike Stein, you get it on over to equinedynamics.com. Fill out that little form there and send your questions in. We'll read them here on the air. And if we read your questions, make sure you also put a return address on there. We'll send you out some madness, some stickers and stuff. And also, uh, we do a podcast don't forget, for every podcast we do, we have a video portion as well. Uh, today would be another great show for you to go over to the YouTube channel. Make sure you like and subscribe over our YouTube because we've got a, a crazy horse that probably looks like the one that Mike was, like the opposite of what Mike was working with yesterday. And you want to see this video, go over to YouTube as well. Make sure you like, subscribe as well. And over to my far hand side is Mike Stein. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you, Travis? Doing all right. Now, we're going to talk about the position of the horse's pelvic and how it affects movement. Yes, yes, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> that's what we're, that's talking, what we're about. talking about. That's what this segment's about. Yeah, we're talking about the pelvis of the horse and positioning, meaning is the pelvis under the horse, out behind the horse? Is it tilted one way, high, low, as far as one side being lower than the other? Is it cocked where it's not straight in a line with the body? If you've got a horse that is a little stuck in the pelvis and it is just a one side shifted slightly forward that on its own you want a horse to push straight forward that puts the push in a direction where it's not straight forward straight forward with the body and pelvis is strictly rear end it has rear nothing all rear end it yeah. doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with the front or anything oh, like it has that. everything to do with the front oh, okay because that's the motor that's the motor pushing but if you're pushing in an odd position in the back end the front's going to have to compensate at some level if your if your body is you know, ideally when you're out a horse trotting out you want them coming right at you. If my pelvis is cocked and it's pushing the rear end around to the right or to the left, 
you're going to, that on its own is going to change the flight pattern of the front, the front end. Didn't we come up with a word for that last time? I, I called it crabbing or something where it kind of. <laughs> crab walking. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll go crab walking, <laughs> dog tracking, the crab walking, not going in the direction the body's aimed. And, you know, working with performance horses, there are many, a lot of people these days will use a chiropractor and they can certainly help. And anything to do with, you know, the barrel, the way the horse, the rider rides. I had someone the other day that is wearing a great big knee brace on their horse or, or not on their horse. They are, but they were talking about getting the horse to ride. They've been off of it for a while and just want to know what I thought. And I said, how do you want your horse to ride? And they're like, what do you mean? I said, you know, I had a, a little incident a few years ago where somebody had a busted up knee and they started riding with one of those great big hinged knee braces. And all of a sudden the horse's movement pattern went a little crazy. And I started getting these calls about, you need to do something because my horse is. And, uh, you know, the knee brace was hitting them. So they were twisting the barrel out to the side to get away from the pressure of the knee brace. When you put somebody on the horse that was not wearing the knee brace, it didn't do that. And, uh, so I don't know how to work around that knee brace just as, just as any kind of, it was rider interference at that point, but that pressure, you know, cock the, cock the rib cage out, cock the pelvis around on the other end. You know, from front to back on a horse, if you've got a pelvis cocked to one side, if you look down that horse's back, it kind of rolls the barrel with the way that the pelvis is wanting to aim most of the time. Nothing's always. And the body will bulge out a little more on that side. And the back ends up curved. All horses are a little, you know, they're curved in the womb, the way they lay in there. And they're always straightened out. But, you know, and also the, you, you start taking the pelvis and drawing an arrow in the direction that the pelvis is aimed. Is that lined up with the rest of your horse's body? Well, you had the picture last week where the horse was kind of like a serpentine. Right. And the mane was laying on the, in that pocket where it bowed out to the one right. side. Yeah, and if they're uneven in the back end, their movement pattern is going to have to, to work around that in the front end become uneven. And then uh, there you go. And then you end up with uneven shoulders and you end up with uneven muscling and, and on, down, on down the line. The other thing is, you know, anything that cocks the pelvis out behind itself. Okay, a bad fit in saddle. If that saddle is biting them in the back, they're going to duck their back out, which is going to put, push the pelvis out behind them. And as far as the effect on the hind legs, remember us talking about that whole low palmer angle thing? Yes. Well, if we shove the pelvis out the back, we try to start straightening the, the hock and stifle. And when you do that, we start getting more downforce in the back of the foot, which starts compressing the palmer angle. We're talking about the palmer angle not allowing the leg to flex. Well, same thing from the top end. The pelvis isn't going to allow the leg to flex, so it pushes the the pelvis, you know, pushes the hind leg straight and shoves the palmer angle down. Now, you were talking about the chiropractor, having a chiropractor come out and, and kind of move and, and adjust the horse as well. Right. Now, uh, my wife also has the electrolysis thing mm -hmm. or the, the shockwave, the shockwave. Okay. Uh, is that part of getting the, the pelvic to straighten or is that strictly muscle? Anything that is muscular is tied to the movement pattern of the horse. Right. So, yes, I'm guessing they're working on muscles. I don't know what they're using the shockwave on to treat at this point. But it, we're all, all of it is tied together. The muscles, the skeletal frame, what I'm doing on the ground, what the rider is doing. And, uh, you know, rider interference is something that is a constant as far as us, us dealing with trying to keep horses together and dealing with people, you know, dealing with people's horses coming up with problems down the road. Now, you mentioned horse um, rider interference. Uh a few weeks back, a prime example was my wife forgot she left her spur on right. on this new gelding that we had, and she made you know the mistake of, of making the you know the spur actually dug up into the horse, and she forgot, and the horse threw her. So I can't imagine what just. Well, a then she became not an interference real fast. <laughs> yes, she did. But I mean, I can uh, I can see like where a knee brace would almost have the same effect. Yeah, exactly. And uh, not to pick on people who've worn knee braces because I've certainly had mine on more than more than one time. Sure. You, every time you come over here to do our horses, you have like tape, magnetic tape straps and everything all over your body. Well, yeah, it's duct tape and barb and in a baling wire. You can hold anything together. And so, you know, paying attention to how that pelvis rotates 
when it moves because you know when a horse is trotting it's up up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down back and forth back and forth and is it the same range of movement up and down on each side also forward to back is when it when it's moving is is one side of the pelvis twisting forward further than the other side okay because you want a nice even rotation of the pelvis and movement of the pelvis if the horse is not remember it's talking about the whole leg flexion back thing if uh, you know on, on the back end deal of the day talking about the joint flexion if you got a horse that is for some reason the pelvis is cocked around because of something that happened up top we're talking about that one hind toe that toe, tends to toe out and if it does it drops and twists the pelvis for the horse to get comfortable he's he's going to have to go more into that kind of a position and you know we can do what we're doing from the ground but if you do not take care of what's driving the pelvis out of position from up top we are constantly chasing it and that could be saddle fit that can be rider sitting off to one side that can be we were out in the field acting like fools and we hurt ourselves <laughs> that's what happens to me most of the time out just cutting a fool in the field and then that's going to have a direct effect on what is happening with your palmer alignment that is ha- going to have have an effect on the rotation of limb in and out that is going to have a direct effect on you know limb flexion and, and limb movement now we have some videos up on the youtube channel of ray morse good good friend of yours who yes. unfortunately passed away too soon uh and he was a horse massager and the, the videos in three separate segments uh they're like maybe 10 15 minutes long and getting up in there and watching ray morse he i mean he digs his hand into the back of that that horse and he can feel all the and he shows you how to and to look for all the the different irregularities that a horse would be so if you're not doing that now this would be a great chance for you to you know take the moment and and right dive that's, into that that's one of those things just a few little small stretching whatever uh you you know somebody can learn a little bit you can pick up some stuff from ray and just start playing with loosen some things up with the body yourself and you'd be amazed if you could do 10 or 15 minutes on every two or three days how much you can do to loosen up a horse it's just with a little bit of training you you can do that and that'll help the pelvic end that'll help the pelvis that will help free up you there's places we need to work on to free up the shoulders uh the shoulders how they move directly affect the hind end the hind end directly affects the front end if we've got a horse that's collapsed in the back it pushes the pelvis out behind it which is affects how the hind legs flex if you got a bat rider problem that's one-sided well there you go again i think there was a nursery rhyme like the hip bones connect to the knee bone and the knee bones connect something to the- <laughs> like that yes yes it is all right guys stick around uh, if you're not on the youtube channel now is a great chance to go over there now because we have this video of a horse that mike has encountered before not this exact horse but how he handles it and he'll give his demonstration on how to stop a kicking horse you're looking to you're listening to equine dynamics with mike stein he'll be right back all right we go there and then six is the video okay you okay yes i'm good (laughs) i'm good popping and cracking things you could be an exotic dancer for the blind (laughs) <laughs> mm, yeah crack 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 oh look listen to him go <laughs> crack 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 <laughs> mm-hmm. <sighs> good times here we go yeah always welcome back to equine dynamics with mike stein he was the 2017 eventing championship farrier and if you'd like to ask mike stein a question the way you do that is go to equinedynamics.com fill out that little form there and get your questions in make sure you put podcasts in the subject line also if you'd like to have mike stein come out and speak at your event or do a clinic at your location then you can fill out the clinic section on the equinedynamics.com and mike will get you scheduled uh spots are filling up quick so make sure you get it in because it's getting towards the end of the year and people want him to come out there and do speak at their event and then uh all that stuff and over my far right side is mike stein and all his stuff how you doing travis <laughs> had, had, had to talk to you this morning i know we spent a good uh 45 minutes up here in the studio just catching up and mike i can see mike in his face i'm like mike what's wrong what's wrong he's like i am sore i'm like you look like you're sore I'm messing with that that draft horse mm-hmm. now when you have when you shoe horses 
outside of the one that wanted to be a statue, on the total opposite of that is you have a horse that would get all agita, is what my wife would say. She, you know, the horse gives me agita. It's all panicky and stuff. How do you deal with it? And if you want to see this video, uh, I'm going to show this video, and Mike's going to uh, break down a step-by-step on how to um, to tame. So, sometimes it's best just to turn around and go home. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not getting kicked in the head today. But this guy right here is giving a small little lesson on what to do uh, when you got a horse, a farrier going out there with a horse, and uh, he's going to start kicking. Let me see if I can start this from the beginning. All right, so if you want to see this video, go over to YouTube, and you can see this video of this young guy. It looks like a young farrier, and he's trying to get this horse's foot up so he can uh, attach a shoe or just trimming and stuff. So here you go. You ready, Mike? Yes. Here we go. Woo! Oh, once you let that toe go, this happens. Yeah, but if you can. Control- so what were you saying <laughs> when the horse does that? It's time for you to. <laughs> Sometimes it's just time to turn and go home. <laughs> well, you know? well, listen to what this guy's saying. This is a, he, you know, he kind of looks like uh, Ray Morris. If Ray Morris had a little bit of a longer beard on, so here we go. You can right. Little <laughs> rib cage. So he's wrapping his arm around the rib cage. Want to be where she can't bite me. Want to be where she can't kick me. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, oh, that horse is kicking. Yeah, she's not playing. You know, see if I can't advance and retreat. So explain what he, where his hand is right there, and what he's doing. Well, the, one, the one hand is across, the arm is across the back, and he's snugged up against the horse. Okay. And it, that's a couple things. If that horse spins away from, him, spins him into to you, he's going to slam you around. As his hands across the back of the horse, as the horse goes back and forth or whatever, he just goes, he just floats with it. The other thing is keeping your body out of range of getting kicked. And he's trying to ease his hand down to where he can touch the leg and start getting a little little, uh, Con- little control there and a little bit past the horse's attitude. <laughs> right. So here we go. You know, if you go down to grab and blow, he'll he'll kind of try to remove your hand. Now, what's he trying? He's trying to break the fetlock? Trying to get break the fetlock. He's, he's pulling on the back of the hock, just trying to get a little weight off the fetlock. And he's easing in and out and trying to get the horse to be okay with the, the movement. And being touched there. And being touched, yeah. If you get too far down the cannon boom, then I can be kicking my hand pretty hard. Right. So I pull that up. And I've had that happen. Oh. Let her relax. Rub her up here. So he's trying to keep her in a position okay. where he has, you know, he's keeping him safe because she can't hook him. And, uh, now, where he's rubbing the horse on the butt, it's like right where the tail meets the right body. Is that a a zone for a horse to relax him, or is that just what happened stance where his hand would be? Because I know my wife, my wife, when the horse is facing me, she says, "Take my thumbs and rub it on the inside of the horse's ears." That's like right. a oh, that feels so good. Well, watch the Ray Morris video, and it'll show you some good contact points on that back end. But, I mean, when I've done done that, I don't necessarily do that, but I'm trying to keep them quiet and give them something that feels a little more like grooming than something you got to kill. Right. So now to explain what he's doing. Okay, he is stepping under. He's getting a hold of the, the toe. When I'm working on the back end of a horse, and they start, you can feel them start trying to put their foot down a little bit or push it down. If you can keep that toe and just cup the foot and keep it turned up, that kind of keeps them flexed in the back end so they can't slam their foot down on top of yours. And in my mind, it's like, you ever seen those karate guys where they take your your hand and they fold it back towards you? And basically they have control little, over you? <laughs> a little bit. You have, it gives you some control of the leg. Right. On the other end, you need to step back and look at the owner and say, somebody needs to, to manage this horse, train right. this horse, put some ground manners on it and get in your truck and drive home because <laughs> when that thing's bust you up and you end up wearing a knee, you wonder why this guy's wearing a big knee brace. Yeah, exactly. You I know, didn't even notice that. He does have one of the knee braces he's on. He's got one of those knee braces on and probably due to something horses have done to him over the years. Twisted him up and around. So here he sure. goes. But in, in that, you've learned how to manage those situations a little better. On, on the other end these days, as as f- many horses are out there con- compared to the population of farriers, we shouldn't be doing that. Back when I started, there were so many young farriers starting every year. We did anything and everything, and did and did that sort of a horse, and and we put shoes on that sort of a horse. But nowadays things are different because not 
in our area, at least in a lot of places in the country, you see very few young ones getting in. And I've had Oops. people call me saying, I got to shoe a horse like that because the young guys won't. Okay, so expect me to go over there and get beat up on your horse. It's not happening. Getting busted up. All right, so here's the end result of, of him grabbing that hoof and bending it up. So there he goes. Mm -hmm. So you said that the horse, doing that, the horse can't put its leg back down or can't extend its its leg. Right. Is you, that you kind of cup it up. And you, you can keep it there without that much effort. Now, and then the horse is quieting down, decide, well, I don't want to kill this guy. <laughs> now, uh, a horse that's broken as to a wild horse dealing with their feet. Any difference? No. Um, you know, Sally was off the range, and I got him where he could help, handle his feet. And Pegasus, the old horse, it took me a long time with him, but I got him where I could handle his feet. And both these guys were Mustangs off the range. And... You know, I worked in a round pen with with them free. I never had either one of them tied when I did the work, but it was just a lot of slow movement. You get to a point, get to a point. That's okay. Back off. We can come to the next tomorrow. Sally, I moved much quicker with, but I worked him in the round pen. And by the time we were done, I could put a, put his feet, all four feet on a hoof stand, and then walk around him and come back, and he'd stand there with his, his you know, his hoof on the hoof stand and stand there quietly like that. <laughs> Wait for you. It. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And it didn't, it didn't take that long with him to do it. Now, Pegasus, he was an older guy when he came in out of the wild. And we never lost that wild. And Sally was more like, he was more like a year and a half when he came in. Pegasus was, was more like 12, 13, 14 when he came in. So he already had his bad attitude or any kind of bad habits already. He was, well, it, to him, they weren't bad habits. He was just who he was <laughs> until people got involved, and he learned that people were, according to him, stupid. Right. <laughs> I feel that way sometimes. All right, guys, stick around. we got one more segment to get into, and we'll let you go back to enjoying the rest of your day. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. Yeah, that horse was kicking. Man, that one jolt, and I'll be like, yep, in the truck. I'm out of here. Yep. <laughs> Well, back when I went to fer ferry school, they showed you how to rope one up and that sort of thing, which I would not do nowadays for anything. Um, drugs are a lot better. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the other thing is if a horse get, gets injured and you roped one up, so it's just it's better to turn around and drive off. Now, he was off. I mean, he was up next to a fence. Right. Is that a good idea or because I would think that the horse would kick and get his leg somewhere locked in between the the triple rail or whatever that is well it depends on the fence <laughs> yeah. i mean uh, the, the side of a, a wall you need you know in that kind of situation you kind of need something so they don't continue to spin away from you because then you can't get it under control <laughs> do it up by a tree yeah <laughs> bank off the tree a couple times <laughs> and on the other end for the price of hospital bills you're going to have to pay just don't yeah don't do right. it yep Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He is now a licensed thoroughbred farrier through the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. And if you'd like to ask Mike Stein a question, feel free to do that at any time. Go over to equinedynamics.com, fill out the little form that says contacts, and make sure you put podcasts in the subject line and a return address, and we'll send you out some magnets, some stickers, and some keychains as well for being part of the show. And over to my far hand side is Mike Stein. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you, Travis? Doing all right. Make sure you follow him on Facebook as well, because believe it or not, Mike, this is the end of season three. Wow. Yes, I know. Been a long time. <laughs> season three. Three seasons down in the books. Uh, after this show, we're going to take a couple weeks off, uh, regather ourselves. we got a whole list of uh, interviews, people coming in in the studio, so make sure you stick around for season four. We're going to take about two weeks off uh, and to get all that uh, caught up and get some new topics and stuff for the next season so we can continue entertaining you and teaching you how to create sounder horses from the ground up. Um, now, Mike. Yes. Um there's an old saying, never look a gifted horse in the mouth. Now, you say never look a gifted horses in the hooves. No, really, in reality, you should look at their feet and look at their mouths okay. and decide it wasn't a gift. Well, well, back then, it was it was considered rude. You know, here's your horse. Here's a horse for, you know, back in the 1800s or when the, the United States was traveling, the big West Concor, uh, con conquering of the West. Uh, people would usually give horses for, you know, hey, thanks for helping me move my trailer. <laughs> Here's a horse, you know, type deal. I don't want this horse. It's got long teeth and the hooves aren't right. But right. but you say, of course. That you should take a look and think about what's going on. Um, 
I had a situation that falls right in this category a few years ago. Okay. A client bought a horse. They brought the horse to the barn. The front feet had about, I don't know, looked like maybe about three rolls of casting material over top of the out of the feet. And I was talking to the owner. I said, okay, what's going on here? Oh, they just did that because the horse has such good feet. They didn't want to mess them up. So they keep them in casting and nail to the casting. As I roll my eyes in the back of my head, I know that's not right. Right. <laughs> and, you know, when you're buying horses, if they've got some kind of odd shoe package on them or something like that, you need to back up and take a look because you could be possibly buying a problem. Hidden problem. Hidden problem. And it's probably not that hidden if you look a little further. And, you know, I don't typically get involved in pre-vet checks, but these days you can certainly take a picture with your phone and send it to your farrier. And, you know, what, what, and what, what do you think about this being on this horse I'm thinking about purchasing? What am I looking at and what are you seeing basically? Right, exactly. And, you know, that could get you out of buying some things that might be missed in a vet check. If some, if, if a horse has something that is majorly therapeutic on, as far as the shoeing, there's probably a reason for it. And do you want to buy that? It's just like, uh, pictures of horses, sell horses that are standing in, in grass to hide the feet, to hide the feet happens all the time. Uh, you know, if, if they've got nice feet, you bring them out on the hard top to take your pictures and you can show, you can show the feet. Now, I don't know the, the series of events that happened when we bought the gelding. I just remember my wife showing me pictures. Oh, look at his movement. Look at his movement. Look how good he is. And I'm, I, you know, it looks, I, me not knowing anything. I'm like going, okay, I can see the horse moving around. I can see it going in a circle, but I don't know, you know, if, if you were to look at that picture, you're like, oh, it's low on the back. It's high in the front. It's all this other stuff. Um, and, but that's my job. That that is your job. Yes. So some people out there need to get some kind of, unless they, you know, not that my wife's well, not a professional, but she knows what she's looking for. But some people out there just don't know. Right. And owners can learn to look, and that's why we we've done, you know, educational venues for owners because you know, to make the whole horse industry better. And for the owners, the best thing they can do is have some education. You can learn to watch a horse and you can learn some, some tricks that I've been taught by many others in my career that I use. And other people are like, how do you pick up on that so fast? There, there are a few tricks to it that you could learn. And that's where, where the clinics come in. And also take advantage of the professionals sur that you're surrounded or surround yourself with professionals, i.e. your, your vet. Uh, your farrier, a, g a good farrier such as yourself, Mike, that's got a, you know a laundry list of of qualifications and and things like that. A chiropractor, uh, a good trainer, you know, use those people. Don't feel bad not reaching out to them and asking their opinion. Hey, what do you think about this? And make sure those opinions that you're giving back, you trust those opinions. Right. And I'm trying to remember. Did Brett go down with your wife to take a look at that horse? Yes. And I think I got a message from Brett, most likely. Yes. Yeah. And all that was kosher dill as far as getting that horse here. Right. You know, because my wife would have said, oh, we're going to get this horse, but he needs this. And I would have said, but we're not getting the horse. You know? No, but, but, you know, I've known Brett for a long time, working on a lot of his clients' horses. And if he goes, a lot of times I'll get, I might get a picture or something or something he's asking me about. What do you think about, is this something we can work with? Or is it to the point we don't need to work with it? Now, Brett was, uh, we had him in the studio back in season two. Right. Uh, so this, it's the same gentleman that we're talking about. Now, Brett, I understand, would see this horse, this new horse that we have, Diego. Um, he sees a future for that horse. Right. And he was even telling my wife, hey, that horse, entry level, getting into shows is going to be the bell of the ball. Right. So he, he he's not just doing it to sell a horse. He's in it because he's got, <laughs> Mike, am I boring you? <laughs> You're boring today, buddy. <laughs> I'm trying to keep me up to speed. Um, he's got a, you know, he's got a, a skin in the game too because this is sure his horse. You know, this is the horse I trained. I represent this horse. This horse. His reputation's on the Oh line. yeah, oh yeah, and and he's got a great reputation reputation as well. All right, guys, stick around. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about what we learned today. You're listening to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein. He'll be right back. If he can keep awake. Yeah. <laughs> if I can keep him awake long enough. Just throw stuff at me. You pop me, yeah. <laughs> Throw a pen at you. 
see what happened is this nice cool room up here we got to talking and you know we've been up here for over an hour or so so you got yeah. to talking nice cool that's nap time yeah it's nap go take a nap on the couch over there <laughs> i've done it sometimes and it's so quiet because no one knows where I'm at. <laughs> you know, if I'm in the house, the dog or the cat or my wife or my dad would come in there. All right, you ready? Yes, ready. Okay. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with my son. The the best podcast. Oh, let me start that over. <laughs> you threw me off. Welcome back to Equine Dynamics with Mike Stein, the best podcast to create sounder horses from the ground up. Mike Stein is a registered journeyman ferry with an APF1 accreditation. Are you awake over there, Mike? I'm awake. Okay, I'm awake. good. So what do we learn today? Uh, the position of the horse's pelvis and how it affects movement. Right. Anything that affects the pelvis movement will affect the way the horse travels. It will affect its gates. It will affect the front end. It will affect the way the horse carries their head. And if you want to see the video of that kicking horse in the farrier in the in the video uh, of how he managed to control that back foot or that back hind quarter, uh, you can check that video out over at YouTube. And Mike, what was your uh, your analysis of that horse foot? Well, he he's right about how to ease in on the leg and how to keep it under control without getting yourself killed. But reality of the situation is more and more with you know. Groundwork, groundwork, and obedience. everything else. Uh, it's not my job to train a horse, and sometimes you need to go home. It's not worth getting put in the hospital over, kicked in the head, or something like that. And you say always look at a, a gifted horse in the mouth and or the hooves. Yes, if you're looking to buy horses, and you're coming across shoeing that is obviously not standard shoeing that does not work around the event you're you're looking for start scratching your head start asking some questions and also take pictures send to your farrier if it's your regular farrier he won't mind taking a quick look and saying hmm okay why are they doing this and then think about it before you get into into or do you want to bring that home so if you have any questions for mike stein make sure you go over to equinedynamics.com fill out the question fill out the contact section at the top of the page make sure you put podcasts in the subject line we'll fill out or we'll send you out some magnets some stickers if you put a return address and if you'd like to have mike stein come out and speak at your event or have him attend one of your events <laughs> or speak at your your establishment make sure you go over to equine dynamics uh and fill out the clinic section and make sure you follow him on youtube and facebook as well mike you're always posting interesting articles up there on your facebook feed as well uh to continue your education as far as the horse world in general and on that note guys we'll let you get back to enjoying the rest of your day on behalf of mike stein over there have a good one my name is travis Holmes. saying see you next week and we're good <laughs> Oh, not see you next week. <laughs> it's not see you next week. <laughs> Hold on. Let's try that again. Ready? Yep. On behalf of Mike Stein over there, my name is Travis Holmes. This will be the end of season three. Uh, don't forget, we're going to take about two weeks off and then come back with season four. So make sure you like, subscribe, and share to us on all your podcast catchers out there as well. iHeart, Radio, Spotify, iTunes, and much, much more. On that note, guys, we're, on that note, guys I'm going to let you get back to enjoying the rest of your day. My name is Travis Holmes saying see you next season. Good night, Ned. Good night, Ned. All right. Okay. And I'll chop that up and stick it back where it belongs. Okay. Oh, season three, Mike. Yep. I do have several people I've talked to in the past about getting them in the show. And I need to get a little more organized on that. Okay. Locking them in. Locking them in, yeah. Uh,